Let's make some noise. You're kicking it with Verb Radio. Mr. Daniel Conrad Cooper, welcome morning. to Verb Radio. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure, Nick. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, so my name's Daniel Conrad Cooper, and I work in film production. Uh, I sort of work in two different worlds. I work on big American studio films that sort of come through Europe, and then I also work on independent films. And I work on the independent films as a producer, and then I work on the bigger films. I started off as a production assistant, literally making tea and stuff, and I've gradually weaned my way up to being production supervisor on, uh, on some bigger films more recently. Okay. Have you got some examples of um, these recent projects you've done? Anything you want to talk about in particular? So, um, well, the most recent big project I did was a film called Dunkirk, which is the next Christopher Nolan film, um, where I was production supervisor working in France and Holland and the UK. Uh, so that was quite quite a big project in the grand scheme. Um, I've also worked on films like um, Red and Red 2, uh, the Total Recall remake, Stardust, Prince of Persia, in lots of different capacities and it's actually that sort of moving around between lots of different departments experiencing lots of different projects in lots of different places that I think has sort of all contributed to helping me to be a good producer uh, and so yeah what grew from small projects in between those big films um, uh, they've grown from sort of short films to big short films to sort of short films that win things um, to then small features to then bigger features and then um, yeah, we just uh, we just wrapped a feature called Another Mother's Son at the end of last year, and I got a feature called Burn 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 that's coming out in cinemas at the end of October. So Burn 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 says a feature. How do you how do you go about getting that made? Okay, so well Burn 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 is a very British film. It's sort of a female driven road trip comedy. Um, I'd spent some time off in in the US and Canada working on projects. So when I came back to England, I was really looking for a film that I could get financed. Uh, finding finance is often the hardest thing with getting a film together. You know, we've all got great ideas, but we've got to find someone to pay for it. And uh, yeah, if you want to work in a film industry, you've got to think, you know, if it's going to be an industry and it's going to be a job for me, I've got to find a way to get paid. And in order to find a way to get paid, you've got to find a way to raise the money and the best way to raise money is to find a product that's actually going to have some value that's some sort of a film that you think is going to be able to sell that's the best way to convince an investor to invest in your film is if you can convince them that people might pay money to go and see it in the cinema so um so that film specifically came together because we were looking at where there was public finance available um, we know that there's a lot of uh, regional funding, there's a lot of funds set up to uh, try and incentivise filming outside of London. So with that film we work with Creative England, who are uh, sort, of, sort of one of our major stakeholders. Um, the film is maybe slightly different to a lot of the films that are out there and, and that was something consciously that we looked at doing was like, what areas of the film industry are being a little bit underserviced? Like, um, what do people want to see that there isn't much of? So, Burn and Burn is like a female driven comedy. Um, so we've got two female leads uh, who go on a bit of ad an adventure around the UK. Uh, great director, Chanya Button. Um, there's a big push to balance the number of female directors uh, represented across the UK. Um, so working with Chanya, who's not only a great director, but also a great female director, has also helped us get some more attention on the project in terms of having female voices and female stories. The screenplay was written by Charlie Cavell, um, who's also a great writer, but also a great female writer. And uh, yeah, so sort of looking at what groups are maybe a little bit underrepresented in the, in the film sphere, uh, means that you can sort of look at where there might be a demand, where there might be an interest that isn't being met. And as a producer, it's sort of, my job to try and steer things towards making them real, um, taking them from an idea to a, a practical position. And um, the best way to do that is to think practically, you know, think about supply and demand. I mean, it's all essentially just a different form of, of business, essentially. Um, and you set up a business to run a film and you want your business to bring something to the market that isn't already there. And hopefully you want people to pay to go and see it or to or you want companies to buy it um, we've got a deal with Netflix um, 
across the world actually. Um, and so the film will be on Netflix at the start of next year and it's about creating content and then promoting it and, um, and having content that you're excited about yourself as well in the first place. It's not just about making something that fits for the market, you've got to want to do it because it's quite a big undertaking, you know, a film. My involvement in this film has been about three years so far. And I say so far because once you work on a film, you work on it forever um, if you're a producer because people will want to buy DVDs hopefully in years to come or people want to relicense it or actors will want a copy of it to send to someone. And um, yeah, so it is very much an ongoing process, which is fun. So it's had a fair bit of success so far then. I'm going to go out and say because you know Netflix is a pretty huge deal. Uh-huh. Um, anything else that has generated from this film that you kind of maybe didn't expect? Yeah, so um, so the film was made with a pretty modest budget, sort of under half a million pounds, and um, which is is a lot of money for, to get someone to trust you with, but um, it's also not a lot of money for a film. Uh, we got some great actors in the film, and we got some actors with some big profile in the film. So our two leads are Chloe Piri and Laura Carmichael, and Laura Carmichael played Lady Edith in Downton Abbey, and that really helped us sort of raise the profile and get lots of attention on the film and helped us to close the finance. And then on the road trip, they meet various fun people. So there's um, there's Jack Farthing, who's in Poldark. There's um, Alison Stedman, who's a great actress, uh, most recently seen in Gavin and Stacey and things. They meet Julian Reintart from Green Wing. They meet Alice Lowe from Sightseers. There's all sorts of fun people that they uh, that they meet on their journey. Sally Phillips from Smack the Pony. Matthew Kelly's in there somewhere. Um, yeah, so it's it's real sort of, a, it's an ensemble film. So it was great working with all those fun, quite familiar faces. Um, so yeah, and because we had some profile, we premiered the film at London Film Festival last year. That was London Film Festival 2015. Um, and we sort of spent this last year going around film festivals and we've had a lot of luck with it winning awards in places that I never expected I would go to. So we won the Grand Prix at Odessa Film Festival in Ukraine, um, which is just quite strange that you make a film about, really about your friends and that's a British comedy, and then you end up going out to Ukraine and meeting literally thousands of people who've watched your film and think it's great. So it was actually the Audience Award we won there. I sat and watched our film uh, in a cinema with uh, 1,200 people in the cinema. I did a little Q&A afterwards, which was utterly surreal. Um, so yeah, we've done well in Ukraine, in Serbia. We won a film festival called Cinema City, an audience award there. Um, Umbria Film Festival in Italy, it won an award there. It's just won an award yesterday in Pittsburgh. Nice. Um, and then it was at London Comedy Film Festival and it was nominated for the British Independent Film Awards Discovery Award. Um, also just at the end of last year. So it's been a, a good journey and uh, you can never really predict that success. You've just got to sort of bring something to market, make it the best you can and then hope that people like it. Sounds amazing. And it's gone quite well now, I'm excited. So why do you think that this film in particular has been like, so successful? Well, um, I think that there's a, obviously, every film is its own thing and um, you know, every film has its own values. Um, For me, I think that this film has been successful because it was quite ambitious. And I think that we set out with an idea that was quite fun. The setup of the film is that these two girls, their best friend has died and he's left them his ashes. And he's asked them to scatter his ashes in these four different places around the UK. And he's recorded a video for each place so that it's a bit as though he's on the road trip with them. Um, so it's quite a dark sort of comedy, but it's quite a fun vibe that happens over the course of the film. Um, I think that what has really connected with people is that um, it is it is fun um, and it is quite honest and it's quite emotional. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, if you can get your audience in, you can then uh, try and win them over to the characters. So specifically for this film, I think that I think it's so common for independent film to not think about being commercial, not think about the market, not think about what people want to spend their time watching. I think that sometimes independent films can be quite depressing. Um, and um, But I don't think that they have to be. I think that if you're looking at making a film, you've got to be thinking, what might someone pay 
ten pounds at a local cinema to watch on a Friday night. What do people want to go and see? And um, while well, sometimes people want to get involved with something quite emotional, um, quite often people want something quite light-hearted and quite fun. And if you can bring a project like Burn 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 that is both fun and quite engaging, hopefully, um, then I think that that's a good recipe for success. The other major thing I think that has really contributed to it is just playing to your strengths, um, which is something that I always say to, to filmmakers is what have you got that other people don't have? And um, ultimately like a road trip move is pretty straightforward. You just got two people in a room and then you move that room around, which sort of gives you some scale from the landscape. So that's what Burn 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 does and it? it's quite beautiful and it's quite big, but it's actually quite a small personal story with quite a big backdrop. So yeah. Sounds really good. I'm quite looking forward to seeing it actually. Good. That's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> so you definitely think that um, there should be more people going to see, you know, these lower budget productions? Because I think from what you're saying alone, it just there seems to be a different level of passion that goes into making these small films. Yeah, I think that there are there are very different worlds and I think that it's very easy when you're studying filmmaking or when you're interested in film to just look at the films in your local view or your local cine world, which are often like huge films that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And having worked a bit in that world, like that's that's a fascinating world to work in. Um, but it is it is a very different machine. It's very much a job because essentially you've got lots of cogs whirring away and every cog is responsible for just one element in that machine. And then the smaller your crew, generally because the smaller, smaller your budget, the more you have to do is a cog in the machine, like right down to, you know, you can shoot a film on your own, but if you're shooting a film on your own, you've got to do, be the director, the producer, the sound man, the cinematographer, in charge of costumes and everything. Um, so yeah, so actually you learn most on a, on a small film. Obviously you need a few other people if you're gonna be learning from them. So actually like an independent film like Burn Burn Burn, where we had a crew of about, you know, between 30 and 40 people most days. Everybody was there bringing their experience and sharing and it was a very collaborative process. So actually the smaller the team, the more that you share with each other, the more that you brainstorm ideas, the more that you adapt to the situation in front of you. On those bigger films, it's much easier to solve problems because you have finance to solve problems. So if something goes wrong, you can pay the money to fix it. Whereas I think on smaller films, you have to all club together and think, we've got this problem, we don't have the money to make the problem go away, so is there a way we can go around the problem? Is there a way we can incorporate the problem into what we're doing? Um, I guess I got quite a good example of that. So the, the road trip in, in this film, for example, um, originally went to Stonehenge and we were trying to do a deal with Stonehenge to let us film there but they're quite restrictive about access to the mighty stone circle um, and then it does get very expensive understandably it's a popular tourist destination and that's part of the reason that we wanted to film there is because it's quite iconic but they know that and they get a lot of requests for filming so for quite late in the day we decided that it wasn't going to work out with Stonehenge and we needed to find an alternative but these girls were on a section of their road trip between London and Cardiff, so we needed to find somewhere else between London and Cardiff. And somebody came up with the idea of Glastonbury Abbey, which is like this beautiful abbey in Glastonbury where King Arthur is buried, and we thought, oh, that's quite a moody place for him to want to have some of his ashes scattered. And so, um, so we went to Glastonbury Abbey. They were really excited to involve us, big fans of Downton Abbey, part of the Abbey Mafia. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so they were really excited to have us there. But then we turned up to film and they said, so what's the scene actually about that you're going to do here? And we said, oh, it's these two girls, they come and they scatter this guy's ashes. And the woman said, oh, I'm really sorry. I, uh, you're not allowed to scatter ashes here. We just don't, just don't allow it. And we're like, what do you mean you don't allow it? Like, that's the, like we're all here now. Like, we need to film this scene tomorrow. Yeah. And they said, oh, look, we have a big problem with badgers here. So, um, so, badgers. Can't, so badgers. Okay. Okay. So we're like, so, uh, so you can't scatter ashes here. We're like, don't worry, they're not real ashes. They said, oh, it doesn't matter if they're not real ashes. The point is, if people see ash scattering in your film, then everyone's going to want to scatter their ashes here. And we're like, oh, like we're a pretty small film. Like, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And they said, no, look, we won't let you scatter ashes. So we sat down and we're like, what are we going to do? We have to film this like tomorrow have to film here, we've got all the people here, all of our kit here. 
So we're like, let's write it in. So that's what happens. Like, so it's written into the script. So now in the film, they go to Glastonbury Abbey to scatter these ashes, and they turn up, and the woman on the desk says, "No way, not allowed to scatter ashes here. We've got a problem with badges." And it's <laughs> one of the funniest scenes in the film, which is great. And they have this whole chat about about badges. So, um, so yeah. So sometimes you have to respond creatively. You know, invariably you haven't got the money to to solve problems, so you have to, you know, if it's raining, you've got to deal with that. If it's glorious sunshine, you've got to deal with that. If it's really windy, um, you know, whatever the world throws at you. Because in film, you're essentially taking a group of people to a new place where they haven't been before to do something they haven't done before. There are always teething problems, and it doesn't matter how much you plan and prepare. That's what producers and that's what production do, is to try and help steer a project through those new environments and to adapt to the problems that arise um, so yeah that's sort of my job as a producer is to problem solve try and anticipate problems when you're putting a project together and to problem solve as you go through the project speaking of, uh, of problems the industry anything that you think uh, could be really you know, they need some attention there the film industry is there anything that you'd you'd say that is kind of lacking or could uh-huh. do more of? Well, I think it's very curious. Like, I mean, we talk about the British film industry, but it is a very disparate thing, in truth, in that there isn't a lot of continuity um, in terms of every film. In order to make a film, you set up a company to make that film. You make that film, and then you move on, and you set up another company to make the next film. And so, there's not a lot of through support like it's uh, an industry of of freelancers so very few people have stability and that makes it difficult to to sort of settle down in your life you know like I don't know I just finished a project I've got a project looming um, but I don't know the next time I'm going to get paid I don't get paid unless a project happens as a producer so at the moment I'm trying to fundraise for my next project but you know, I'm not earning any money and that's a pretty unstable situation. And then if that film doesn't happen, then what do I do? Like I can end up spending six months, you know, I've been working on this next project for four years on and off. Um, But if that project doesn't happen, I've put a lot of time and energy, lots of cups of tea, lots of meetings, all gotta be paid for. Um, And so you can get left quite stranded on your own. So for me, I think what the industry needs to do um, when I say the industry needs to do it, we, the people working in the industry, need to do it, is to support each other and to keep talking. Let's try and make the British film industry a bit more commercially minded. Let's think about how can we get our films to be more valuable. Um, we're in a situation now where our pound is a little bit weaker because of Brexit stuff, which I'm not going to get drawn on <laughs> Brexit. But um, actually, weirdly, that means that it's cheaper to make films in England than it has been before for foreign money. And our films, because we have English language films, we can sell them in America and we can sell them across the world. If we were in another country, like I've been working in Holland a bit recently, and Dutch films, when they make a film in Holland that's in Dutch, they basically either sell it in Holland or they don't. And they're going to really struggle to sell that Dutch film anywhere else at all. So we have a big advantage here in England because we have English language, which is very universal on the internet, you know, through Netflix. We have this huge market in America, Australia, German markets very large, all of which want English language content. So we do still have this big opportunity that we're not making the most of. And we have a problem really in this country that it's very difficult to get your film into cinemas because a lot of the, even the independent cinemas are now focused on making money and rightly so because they're independent companies trying to make money and that means that they're taking a lot of these big American films that are maybe more entertaining and less challenging and I think that when people go to the cinema they want to be challenged a bit, they don't want to just sit there and passively enjoy a bunch of explosions, they want to be engaged in some way, they want to care about the characters and I think that independent films often do that a lot better in terms of like winning people around and taking them on a bit of a journey. Um, And so what I think we need in the UK is to start supporting independent film more by going to see it, by taking chances on films that maybe we don't know much about and that don't have big famous people in, um, to support those people so that those people can tell good stories and then hopefully they can get bigger budgets to make their next projects and they can tell bigger stories and we can like support ourselves a bit more here because essentially a lot of the crew working in the UK there's a big industry here 
but that's sort of a, an industry that supports a lot of foreign filmmaking. All these big American films that come here, the Captain Americas and Avengers and things that film over here, employ thousands of people, literally. But are those people getting to tell their own stories? Are those people growing? Um, quite often those people are being hired to do stuff they've done before. There's not much development of, um, of individuals in, in any of the departments. There are a few unions trying to make some difference to that, Beck to do a great job. Um, but it's really up to supporting independent filmmakers to continue to give opportunities to people so that we can hear fresh voices and so that new voices can come through. Because we're at a slight risk, I think, at the moment of just being a, a facilitator for American films and losing our own voice by not supporting the films that are coming out and through the UK. Very insightful. Oh. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, all right, stepping back a little bit now. Uh, a film about your life. Who's going to play you? Well, a film about my life is maybe not the most exciting thing ever. In that, while sounding, while being a producer might sound quite glamorous and exciting, it involves quite a lot of Excel, lots of spreadsheets, lots of uh, tapping away on emails. Um, I guess. When I was a little bit younger, I was once mistaken for James McAvoy. I think we have a slightly similar nose um, in the right light, maybe not always. So, yeah, I think, you know, McAvoy's a pretty good actor. I so, yeah, I'd, I'd take, I'd take no, that. Said yeah, I guess, yeah. Although I think as I'm getting older, maybe a bit more James Spader, which, um, you know, maybe not such a good look. <laughs> so I need to work on that. Or... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what do you think the kind of uh, pinnacle story point would be so far in your career if you was in the film, what would be that kind of big whoa, climax? Well, I think that as a filmmaker, like the first, like actually genuinely, like the most rewarding thing in film is the first time that you see your name up on a screen um, in a cinema that other people have paid to go and watch a film and then there's your name. And um, the first time you see your name on the screen is maybe not a great moment for the movie um, <laughs> but uh, it's a really rewarding thing and you suddenly start like getting very excited about this idea of wow my name was right at the bottom of the credits as Chief T-Boy or whatever and uh, you start to really think wow I want to push my name up I want to try and get near the top and actually that's quite an interesting thing as well is that it's very unlikely that people are going to give you a job that you haven't done before um, and because of that it's very important that as a f an in independent filmmaker, if you want to be a director or you want to be a producer, or even if you want to be an actor, um, you know, with a lead role in stuff, sometimes you have to go and make your own stuff and you have to give yourself that role because it's very difficult for other people to trust you to do something you haven't done before. But if you want to be a director, go and write something, pull some friends together, direct something to show that you can do it produce something to show that you can do it, write something to show you can do it, act in something to show that you can do it. And then you've got something you can demonstrate, you know, I am capable of this. And if you can demonstrate that you're capable of doing it with no budget, then chances are you'll next be able to demonstrate you can do something with a small budget. And if you do something well with a small budget, medium budget, bigger budget, hey, I'm at the moment trying to raise one and a half million pounds for my next project, which mm -hmm. I mean, there's a crazy amount of money when you stop and think about it. But, you know, literally from increments, from making short films for 500 quid that they've just grown and grown and grown to now a stage where I can sit down with people and say, look, I'm trying to raise one and a half million quid and I can justify why I need that money and how I'm going to spend it. And occasionally they think I'm going to be responsible and spend that money wisely so they trust me with it so but it's a very gradual process you know it, which is why you need to watch these smaller films to get a sense of what works like what is successful what short films did get BAFTA nominated last year what short films won Oscars um, what independent films won at the Biffers um, you know it's good to go and see those smaller films to see what a hundred grand film looks like, because the chances are you'll have to make a hundred grand film before anyone's going to let you make a hundred million pound film. Rightfully so. <laughs> Rightfully so. Um, would you? What kind of advice would you offer to anybody interested in breaking into the industry, whether it be as a producer, director, mm -hmm. writer, kind of anything? So I think that the main bit of advice would just be to get as much experience as you can. Um, really, the more that you work on, the more lines there are on your CV. 
um, the more valuable you can be to a team. Um, so when I'm putting together, you know, a production department for my for my features, what I'm looking at is people who've experienced different things to bring those people together. Because actually, the more projects you work on, the truth of it is, the more problems you've encountered, the more you've dealt with what happens when the camera van doesn't turn up, what happens when it's raining. Like, how do we adapt to these problems that arise? And the more experience you have of dealing with those problems, the more experience you have of solving those problems. Like, oh, the caterers haven't turned up. What do we do? I can't find this cable. What do we do? And so actually, for me, someone who's worked on more projects, you know, it's important that they're projects of a certain size. But, you know, it's all very well you saying that you've directed 20 films and they're all like two minute films on your iPhone. Um, the more you've got a network to help you solve problems as well, that's generated by working on projects. Like ultimately, if I need a grip tomorrow, I have got in my phone maybe 30 grips that I've worked with on the 30 films I've worked with in the, on the, in the last 10 years. And so I've got, I can be more useful because I've worked on lots of stuff, mm -hmm. because I've worked with lots of different people that I can phone to help me solve problems that come up. So yeah, I would say volunteer on other people's sets. If you want to be a producer, a director or a writer, the best thing you can do is get experience of how independent film works. So it's actually valuable to go and make the tea on someone else's set, talk to people, see how it works, and then pull those people together to make to make your own things. Um, so yeah, more experience you've got, the better you'll be at your job. So it's not just about lines on the CV, it does actually make you better at doing any job in film. Pretty solid advice. <laughs> right, well, yeah. No, I don't think enough people really talk about it as well, because I think that a lot of people who who study film can get quite caught up in the theory of it and not think enough about the industry side of it. And the truth is that you need to build a network, whatever aspect of film you're working in, you don't get hired by a company in the land of film, you get hired by people. Um, and so you need to know lots of people. And really, so that's how I started out. I was making tea on this film called Stardust and I just turned up every day, made as many friends as I could and tried to impress everyone by being super keen, uh, mastered that photocopying machine back in the day. Um, and then all those people that I worked with on that film went on to other films and they started phoning me up. Dan, do you want to come and do this? Dan, do you want to come and do that? And really my whole career all stems back to that job where I just put a ton of effort in. And then on every job since, I've also put a ton of effort in and that's kept my work coming in. So yeah, it's about creating a network. And when you come out of a film school or a film course, you're starting off with the same network as everyone else who's come out of that film course. So you've got to find a new network, like go on manly.com, volunteer on other film students' projects, like it's valuable. Like the more people you know, the more likely you are to get hired and the more material that you put out into the world, you know, the more films you've got on your website, the more, you know, films that you post on your Facebook page, whatever, the more chance there is that one of your Facebook friends will be like, will meet Ryan Gosling in a bar and Ryan Gosling will be like, hey, I really want to do a short film in England. And then your Facebook friend will be like, hey, I've got a friend who makes quite good films. <laughs> I've seen them on his Facebook page. And then he ends up giving your number to Ryan Gosling and suddenly Ryan Gosling's in your movie. I mean, like, it's a crazy example, but like literally stuff like that happens. Maybe not with Ryan Gosling every day. But um, yeah, so it's important not only to create a network for yourself, but also to make your network work for you. Like if you make good films and you put them on your Facebook, then people will watch them and will pay, they, those people will tell their friends, hey, I've got this guy who makes quite good films. And so if an opportunity comes up, they'll come to you. Um, so yeah, so if you, uh, you only need to put out a couple of rubbish films on your Facebook and then all your networks will be like, oh, I don't really like the films that he makes. And then when that opportunity comes up and the guy's chatting to Ryan Gosling in the bar, he's not gonna say, you should meet my friend because he's not gonna think that you're a great filmmaker. Um, and so you've always got to put your best foot forward. You've always got to be presenting the best version of yourself. Uh, you've got to be quite nice. You've got to be quite confident because you need to impress people all the time. And so it's quite an exhausting process being a, a freelancer because you're, you're always selling yourself and you're always 
looking for opportunities and presenting yourself as an opportunity to other people as someone to work with. So uh, yeah, it's pretty involved. I like it, it's good. I'm gonna definitely take it on myself anyway. <laughs> All right, good luck. Um, if anybody wants to find your work or keep up to date with what you're up to, have you got social media or website people can find you on? Yeah, so my company is called Rather Good Films. Um, so my website is rathergoodfilm.co.uk. Um, I also have a slightly complex name, Daniel Hyphen Conrad Space Cooper. So I'm quite Googleable. Um, if you want to Google me and see some of my films, see some of my trailers, um, and yeah, Burn 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 is up on Facebook, just forward slash Burn 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 Film on Facebook. And uh, yeah, we've got a bit of a media push at the moment, so hopefully the trailer will be coming to your Facebook feeds, to your Twitter, and uh, yeah, the film is sort of playing, it's on limited release across the UK from October 28th, so please do go check it out, and if you've got any questions, literally email me, and um, hey, let's talk about it. Brilliant. Thank you very much for coming down today. It's nice to meet you. I've had a brilliant idea. I bequeath you my ashes. Road trip. Woo. That's where he wanted to be stowed. He put some thought into it. This is Thelma and Louise plus Casper the Friendly Ghost. Glastonbury Abbey. Oh, it's beautiful. We've never allowed scattering. No way, Jose. <laughs> Helicopter arms. Confuse the attacker. Uh, hello? All part of the journey, though, isn't it? Let's do it. A scatter down. Where possible, do a U turn. This trip is not just about me. To Dan. To Dan. To Dan. Have time to just work out some stuff. Make the most of every tiny little second you've breathed. You are welcome.